further. The importance of being Oscar. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my tribute to a poet, playwright, storyteller, someone without whom our lives would be less amusing, Oscar Wilde. I begin with a quotation from Lady Windermere's fan, a play originally performed 127 years ago at St. James Theatre in London. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Wow. <laughs> I invite you to join me in looking at a particular star, Oscar Wilde. Oh, just a few housekeeping points to mention. For those of you who came by dog cart, <laughs> may I remind you that parking is free? <laughs> Secondly, should the fire alarm sound, you may escape from the flames by leaving the church where Dr. Chasuble is preaching one of his unpublished sermons on manna in the wilderness. <clears throat> oh, and thirdly, if any mobile phones should ring, that will be an anachronism. So you can't have that. They'll be thrown out the window. And returning now to my theme, Oscar Fingal of Flaherty wills why. He was born in Dublin on the 15th of October, 1856. His mother, Lady Wilde, was a flamboyant poet. His father was a surgeon and renowned as a conversationalist. So we can see where Wilde got it from. The seeds were sown. He attended Portora Royal School, where he was nurtured, and his enjoyment in the classics led to a love of storytelling. His academic success resulted in his winning a scholarship at Trinity College, Dublin, in 1871. His interest in asceticism and poetry was pursued further by going up to Oxford in 1874. He lost his Irish accent and adopted less conventional dress. He graduated with a first class honours in 1878 and then moved to London, becoming well known, mixing with artists such as James Whistler and actresses such as Ellen Terry. Apparently, the Prince of Wales, later to become Edward VII, observed, I do not know Mr. Wilde, and not to know Mr. Wilde is not to be known. <laughs> Quite witty for a royal. <laughs> I was going to interrupt history at this time, but I am told I can't, so I have to carry on. <laughs> I shall turn the page. If asked what is one of the best known quotations from Oscar Wilde, I think I would select my favourite as Lady Bracken from The Importance of Being Earnest. I expect most of you are familiar with her, but uh, she is a formidable character. Mm. And this is her talking to her daughter, Gwendolyn. And Gwendolyn has just announced 
I'm about to be very loud. <laughs> Gwendolyn has just announced that she is engaged to be married. Lady Brackenwell is not amused. She says, Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to anyone or someone, I and your or your father, should his health permit, <laughs> will inform of that fact. <laughs> An engagement should come upon a young girl as a surprise, <laughs> pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. It is hardly a matter that she should be allowed to arrange for herself. Mm. Oh dear. <laughs> Not going well, is it? Well, we'll have some more of Lady Bracknell later. I'm looking forward to that. Mm. I hope you are. <laughs> Oscar Wilde travelled to America on a lecture tour. In the customs department, he was challenged by an official who asked, Say, Mr. Wilde, have you anything to declare? Oscar Wilde responded, I have nothing to declare but my genius. <laughs> I don't know what the official thought, whether he thought that maybe he could stamp on it or something. <laughs> anyway, Oscar Wilde was certainly versatile. I should like to give you some evidence of that. He had two sons, Cyril, <laughs> and Vivian, born in 1885 and 1886. And for them, he wrote stories as entertainment. These stories were published in 1888. And I'll give you two samples, one from The Happy Prince and one from The Selfish Giant. Happy Prince. High above the city, on a tall column, stood the statue of the Happy Prince. He was gilded all over with thin leaves of fine gold. For eyes, he had two bright sapphires, and a large red ruby glowed on his sword hilt. He was very much admired indeed. He is as beautiful as a weathercock, remarked one of the town councillors who wished to gain a reputation for having artistic tastes. Only not quite so practical, he added, fearing lest people should think him impractical, which he really was not. Why can't you be like the happy prince? asked a sensible mother of her little boy who was crying for the moon. The happy prince never dreams of crying for anything. I'm glad there is someone in the world who is quite happy muttered a disappointed man as he gazed at the wonderful statue. He looks like an angel, said the charity children as they came out of the cathedral in their bright scarlet cloaks and their clean white pinafores. How do you know, said the mathematical master. You've never seen one. Ah, but we have in our dreams, answered the children, and the mathematical, mathematical master frowned and looked very severe, for he did not approve of children dreaming. <coughs> so that is the 
start with a happy prince. And then we have the selfish giant. Every afternoon, as they were coming home from the school, the children used to go and play in the giant's garden. It was a large, lovely garden with soft green grass. Here and there, over the grass, stood beautiful flowers like stars, and there were twelve peach trees that, in the springtime, broke out into delicate blossoms of pink and pearl, and in the autumn bore rich fruits. The birds sat on the trees and sang so sweetly that the children used to stop their games in order to listen to them. How happy we are, they cried to each other. Well, one day, a giant came back. Mm. He'd been to visit his friend, the Cornish Ogre, mm. and had stayed with him for seven years, as you do. After the seven years were over, he'd said all that he had to say, but his conversation was limited, <laughs> and he determined to return to his own castle. When he arrived, he saw the children playing in the garden. What are you doing here? Mm. He cried in a very gruff voice. And the children ran away. My own garden is my own garden, said the giant. Anyone can understand that, and I will allow nobody to play in it but myself. <laughs> so he built a high wall all around it and put up a notice. Trespassers will be prosecuted. He was a very selfish. Giant. Hmm. Hmm. So, I think the stories are charming. But I've mentioned his sons without giving credit to their mother. <laughs> their mother was called Constance Lloyd, and she was the wealthy daughter of a Dublin barrister. They had married in 1884, and they'd settled in Chelsea in Tyke Street. The previous year, Oscar Wilde had visited Paris, and amongst other people, he had met there Daudet and Victor Hugo. Do you like my French accent? Alphonse Daudet et Victor Hugo! <laughs> Mais oui. Thus, Wilde had travelled both in Europe and the United States at a time when this was more difficult, more laborious, and less common. Wilde was noted, if not notorious. <laughs> now, to quote from his novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, there is only one thing worse in the world uh, being talked about, and that is not being talked about. <laughs> not being talked about is certainly not something for which Wilde could be criticised. Well, having mentioned Dorian Gray, it seems appropriate to give a longer reading in which the eponymous character is introduced. And this was published in Lippincott's magazine in 1890. Mr. Dorian Gray, who is he? asked Lord Fermor, knitting his bushy eyebrows. He is the last Kelso's grandson. I knew his mother 
intimately. I believe I was at her christening. She was an extraordinarily beautiful girl and made all men frantic by running away with a penniless young fellow, a mere gnome, a subaltern in a foot regiment or something of that kind. The poor chap was killed at a duel a few months after the marriage. They say Kelso got some Belgian brute to insult his son in law in public. The fellow spit at his man. Kelso brought his daughter back. She never spoke to him again. She died within the year, left a son. Like his mother, must be a good looking chap, pot of money waiting for him. Not of age yet. His mother was one of the loveliest creatures I ever saw, could have married anybody she chose. <sighs> she was romantic, though. <laughs> Carlington went on his knees to her. She laughed at him. So that's where the character Dorian Gray is introduced. Having mentioned Dorian Gray, I have given the introduction. But an epigram, further epigram drawn from this work, I like men who have a future and women who have a past. point of view. <laughs> However, in my view, it's quite applicable to another of Wilde's renowned masterpieces of the theatre. I refer, of course, to the one of the most popular and frequently performed plays, namely The Importance of Being Ernest. The devious Jack Worthy, who definitely has a skeleton in his cupboard, and the imperious and unforgettable Lady Bracknell, who also has a secret. The scene in which the latter interviews the former is a classic. Mm. It illustrates admirably the pomposity, class consciousness, and self opinionated nature of the matriarch and the wiliness and desperation the prospective eligible backdrop. It is eminently memorable. Written in 1894, it opened to enthusiastic reviews at the St. James Theatre the following year. Now, shortly after Jack is proposed to Brendan in Act One, his mother enters to cross-examine the hapless would-be fiancé. And here, you're going to have to use your imagination somewhat, since I am going to play both parts. Uh, unfortunately, my fellow actor was not available. <laughs> so, uh, both Lady Bracknell and Jack Worthy. And I hope you'll be able to tell the difference. Uh, Jack uh, is greeted by Lady Bracknell. Lady Bracken sits down. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthy. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. Lady Bracknell has got a pencil and note pad in her hand. <laughs> I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men. <laughs> Although I had the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton. We work together, in fact. <laughs> However, I am quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? <laughs> well, yes, I must admit I smoke. I am glad to hear it. 
a man should always have an occupation of some kind. <laughs> there are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? <laughs> 29. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should either know everything or nothing. <laughs> Which do you know? <laughs> and I know nothing, Lady Grapnel. I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it, and the bloom is gone. <laughs> the whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. <laughs> Fortunately, in England, at any rate, <laughs> education produces no effect whatsoever. <laughs> what is your income? <laughs> um, between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or in investments? Uh, in investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted of one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it, about 1,500 acres, I believe, uh, but uh, I can't uh, say that I depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people who make anything out of it. <laughs> a country house. How many bedrooms? Oh, well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. You have a town house, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to live in the country. Well, I own a townhouse in Belgrave Square but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Uh, of course, I can get it back whenever I like, at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham. <laughs> I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She is a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, ah. <laughs> Nowadays, that is no guarantee of respectability, of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. Oh, the unfashionable side. <laughs> I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the sign? <laughs> Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? Oh, I'm afraid I, I really have none. Mm, well, are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. And to lose one parent, Mr. <laughs> Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. <laughs> to lose both 
looks like carelessness. <laughs> Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the uh, purple of commerce? Or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? Uh, I'm afraid I, I really don't know, Lady Brackmore. <laughs> I said I had lost both my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say I, my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who my parents were, uh, uh, who I am by birth. I was, well, I was found. Found! <laughs> the late an old gentleman of very charitable and uh, kindly disposition found me and gave me the name of Worthington because he happened to have a first class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Uh, Worthing is a, a place in Sussex, it's a seaside resort. Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first class ticket for this seaside resort find you in a handbag? A handbag? Yes, I was in a, a, a handbag, a somewhat large. Leather. Uh, black leather handbag with handles uh, to it, uh, an ordinary <laughs> handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station, it was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station. <sighs> yes, the Brighton line. <laughs> the line is immaterial, Mr. Worthy. <laughs> I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate, bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, <laughs> seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary niceties of decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I trust you will remember what that unfortunate movement led to as for the particular location <laughs> in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion, <laughs> has probably indeed been used for that purpose before now, but it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. May I ask you then what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. 